All right, everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Doug Hall, and he is the president of his own company. Um, and I've done my due diligence, and I looked him up on Facebook, uh, the great source of all good information. And he is a self-described raconteur, culture junkie, and unicorn whisperer. I'm excited to hear a little bit about those things. So here's how I, uh, I know Doug from the college world because Doug is the source of all information, virtual and tech prior to this. Um, and I had questions for him a couple of weeks ago about uh, in a classroom, how do we, how do we have a classroom of students uh, be able to, some kids come to school, some kids stay home. I asked Doug the question, answered immediately. <laughs> We're going to get to Doug in a minute. We're going to get to Doug in a minute. We're going to talk about virtual stuff. We're going to talk about all the things you know. But what the world wants to know is what is your cat's name? My cat's name is Milo. <laughs> Milo, okay. Tell, tell me a little bit about Milo. Well, it's very interesting. It was actually at a college conference. I was at um, one of the Southern region, region conferences back in well, 11 years ago because he's about 11 years old. And uh, my wife at the time, uh, called while I was at the conference and she said, there's a cat on our back deck. And I'm like, whatever you do, don't feed it. She's like, well, I'm like, all right, all right, okay, okay. Don't let him in the house. Yeah. I'm like, where is he now? She's like, well, he made it out to the garage, but he refuses to leave the garage. So I'm like, leave the door cracked just enough so he can get out if he wants to. Yeah. And if he's still there in a couple of days when I get home or whatever, I'll figure it out. He went through the divorce we left with me. He's been through <laughs> three homes. He's been with me ever since. So it was like, I never took you as a cat guy. I'm like, I'm not. He just adopted me. And I haven't gotten rid of him since. You have, you have had this cat for 11 years. That's 11 awesome. years. Milo the cat. Now we know everything we need to know about you, Doug. Yeah, actually, any of my social feeds, you will just see more pictures of him than you'll ever see of me. But that's because he's well, just really handsome. I, did my, I, I, I definitely saw how handsome Milo is. On He's a looker. He is a, he's a cat. He's what a kept cat, him alive. Cat. All right, so also, where are you in the world? Where are you today? I'm wherever I need to be, my friend. Right. I'm, uh, I'm working out of my offices in uh, St. Louis. So I, uh, oh, cool. I, I'm a proud resident of the city of St. Louis or thereof for the last 20 something years. Wow, and you've been, you've always been involved in the tech side of things. It was like an early interest of yours, right? Um, you know, I think the interest was uh, efficiency. So yeah. I always liked any kind of, uh, any formula, any system, and obviously technology applies very heavily here, that made things faster, more efficient, could get to results. I was always, yeah. my brain has always been wired around hacking something. How do I get from point A to point B faster than a straight line? Yeah. And, you know, when it came, I'm not a, in any way a coder. I can, I always joke, I'm a digital strategist in the sense that I know how things work, I, but I can never build them. Uh -huh. uh, kind of like a car guy could say, that's got a such and such engine, but you put them under the hood, they might not know where anything is. It's how I roll. But I've always been fascinated with tools yeah. that makes things work faster. So even when I was in the uh, entertainment space and the agency space, how I emailed, uh, you know, yeah. things like that. I was one of the first people on Constant Contact. I used to use bots for MySpace uh, marketing. That's how long You're ago early I, I was buying tools. You like the technology. I like the hack. You like the hack. So when we, when we as, a, as, a, as, a, as a world or as a world of higher ed, you know, moved online uh, this spring, you were ready for it. Yeah, it's an interesting scenario. I was running a company up until January that did specifically that, virtual experiences, and I decided to go out on my own and create a consulting firm that was more about that, more about strategy rather than just the virtual piece of it. But the second the pandemic broke out, my phone was just blown up because everybody's like, oh, now we have to figure out how these flying yeah. cars work. And I'm like, oh, I've been doing that for the last five years. I, but, I mean, a little piece of information. I had never made a video call before I started working at that company. It, it, this has changed a lot of our lives, but you're way ahead of me even. I'm, I'm now interviewing virtually and performing virtually. But my first call was in March of 2020. I'd never been on a Zoom really? prior to that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I love it. I love the, I love the platform. I love that we're here together. I love that we're connecting. Um, and it shows. That's the thing. Oh, You've okay. embraced it. Thank you. That's yeah. a big piece of it. It doesn't matter if you started in March or three weeks ago. It's, these tools aren't that difficult to understand. It's just more fascinating to get with them and yeah. then they become applicable to your everyday tasks. Then you're like, cool, I could turn this on, turn yeah. that on. It's, it's a really good way to acclimate yourself fast. It's just to really enjoy it. What should we think about as a community 
um, of people who like, like I'm, I'm thinking about the performers, the artists, the schools that, that have been doing in-person events for the, over the years. And they've, and they've really done an amazing job in the last few months of doing virtual events. But what are like the, what's the main thing one should think about when, you know, if you're brainstorming events for this fall, what, what, is, what is something we, we should focus on when thinking about taking an in-person live event and making it virtual? The goal. The goal. I would say that that's the number one thing if I had, and there's a lot of things to think through, but if you're going to think about something when you're considering the technology, when you're considering the stack maybe, or how you're going to invite people or what, the goal is always the reason for doing something. And I think especially what I witnessed or experienced, and this isn't just exclusive to higher ed or to you know student activities, but in spaces that have to um, readjust or pivot, mm -hmm. they look at it in almost a very binary way. It's either this or that, and it's, it's not that. It's literally the same thing you were doing before with a lot cooler tools, toys, literally. And in the same sense, if you looked at it as, I had an event I used to do in one day, how am I gonna do that whole event now on Zoom? You're already looking at it the wrong way. You should say that event was about engaging students or orientation or um, a knowledge fair, whatever it is. So our goal is to make sure we engage X amount of students and fulfill them at, you know, to, to X to Y point. Now you could do that over a period of eight weeks. You could do it with a bunch of different tools. You can bring them in from other sources. When you pull back and look at the actual objective in front of you, yeah. suddenly the roadmap opens up because it's now not geographically or even time-wise, you know, it's not a time, day, location type of thing anymore. I call it the, the precipice of the mountaintop. It's like you can work yeah. your way up to the event and then work your way out of it. You have so much more points of activation. So one way I'm, I'm interpreting that is that you're thinking about asking why are we doing the event in the first place and does it have to be the event or it's the why? And how do we measure That's success? Cool. Why, yeah, why are we doing, what was our goal? What, were our, what, were our, what was our ambition? And if our intent was to make connections with students, then how do we achieve that instead of thinking about the event itself? Is that- yep. Exactly. And that? look at it as measuring in small steps mm -hmm. instead of, so I, I talk a lot about it's not about attendance, it's about attention. Mm -hmm. So people are like, I have to get 300 people to show up for this, or last year we did this. Well, if you put 300 people in a room last year, were they all listening the whole time? Were they all actually capturing what they were supposed to? Or do you remember looking around at me like, these people aren't even paying attention, or they're not even participating? You have this ability now to track, measure, and engage in different areas. So instead of trying to bring everybody together in one space and get them to listen at the same time, you're gifted with the ability to speak to them on multiple channels with multiple voices and with multiple people engage them at their level create something gamify it mm -hmm. there's so many more options now that it you really understand. does it opens up the way you're looking at that one event that yep. one event doesn't need to be thought of as that one event it's it's a piece of a bigger picture oh, and that is what programming is that is what education is it's not about one test it's not about one event it's about the engagement, education, learning, and growth of those individuals that are in your care and your responsibility. So how to use these tools to do that instead of, oh, I gotta get six weeks now all virtual. No, how you use those six weeks to say, I'm gonna impact these students or whomever as best as I can with these tools, if not better than I could before. Do you have favorite tools? It's like picking a favorite child. I do, um, <laughs> but I always say the tool is based on the objective. Okay. So I, I make the joke, I'm not going to tell you if you've got a good hammer and then find out two weeks later, you're holding a bag of screws behind your back. Right. So it's like Zoom is great because it's a reliable, stable platform for doing just this. But yeah. if somebody said to me, hey, uh, we're going to do a national broadcast of this concert on Zoom, I'd be like, no, you're not. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a conferencing tool. It's a great conferencing tool, but you should never dedicate or you shouldn't paint yourself in a corner with, with, with tech buys that limit your ability to, um, you know, exponentially impact. So if you buy Zoom and you're like, this is what we're using for the semester, you've just eliminated all these other options. Now, granted, you can use Zoom to stream to YouTube or do whatever you want to do. But the cool thing about tech is you could toss it. SaaS software allows you to try things out. Mm -hmm. So you can, in the early stages, people are forgiving. 
So I try Blue Jeans, I try Zoom, I look at Google Meet as far as that those pieces are concerned. But then, you know, you have to start looking at what streaming looks like. And then you get into areas like uh, you can get into cellular bonding technology and how you like the new Mevos are awesome. They've got um, now you can just drop a live stream camera and edit in real time and push it out to a streaming network. So if you're doing a copy, what's a Mevo? What's a Mevo? It's just a line of camera, but they were like the first to like build the streaming live event camera. So it's a very uh, easy to manage, user interface is easy, plug and play, but they come with a Wi-Fi connectivity so that you can just drop them wherever you are, stream to wherever you want to go. And now I believe it's not the Mevo, it might be another camera, so I'm holding to this. They're using cellular bonding, which means you can tie to cell towers or, you know, and literally um, stabilize the connectivity. So if the Wi-Fi dips, it leans on. And so you have a steady stream. So if you're doing like a, you know, a sing-along or you're playing some coffee house thing and you just, the, the, somebody who's in student affairs comes and drops that Mevo and plugs it into their Facebook live stream, right. does it all for you on the spot. You don't need a computer. You don't need to log in anything else. Done. So that's great for that use. So any any in-person events, moving forward. So let's say that I do go to a campus and I do a coffee house show, the advisor could still bring the Mevo and we could reach all the online students. You could bring your own. You just said, what can us on the artist side do? What can we offer? What can we offer? That's a gift to the actual schools because they don't want to have to be responsible for that technology, have somebody to set it up, purchase things. If you say, hey, I have live stream capability as long as you have a stable Wi-Fi and I can tap into Verizon or whatever there. I will, you know, also set up a live stream to one of your Facebook groups and, you know, the cost of your gear, you throw it into your feed. Now, that seems like it would also work in the classroom, right? But, but that's what the it's- The problem with that is it's not two way. It's one way, right. See what I mean? Yep. I so see. you want to look at the tool for the job. That's great for broadcasting out where people can just type in a Facebook group, this was awesome and watch live. And you can have somebody monitor that. But if you want the artist to then see back, yeah. you know, the Mevo might not be the right option. Gotcha. Tool for the oh, job. You too, man. You, you tool for the job. <laughs> Think about the objectives or the outcomes and right. then look at what you're researching and saying, will this help me achieve that to the best of its ability? And then also consider all of the other things you have to do within a, a certain time frame and say, would it still be applicable in those areas yeah. or would it be hobbling me? And then you can balance out your tech and say, I'm going to, I mean, Amiibo you can use endlessly because you could say i'm going to put it out for you know if we're doing a hybrid event we're just going to drop a stream you could still do a zoom call and drop a stream you can have different things going you can, on. you can do both right yeah absolutely nobody's yeah. saying you can't it's not binary but so that for a 300 400 investment it's not bad for a school or an artist to have this drop and play kind of technology right but that shouldn't be the only tool you use for every single it's not like you know it's Right. It's like anytime you, your, your family bought something, it's like, no, I got to use the new thing. Yeah, you, just, I, you know how much that cost me? It's like, don't use the wrong tool for the job just because you bought it. Just because you bought it. That's great advice. Don't <laughs> use the tool for the job just because you bought it. It's, I it's, it. it's, I see a lot of people ask questions. Well, we're on this. Uh -huh. So how do we use this? Well, you use it for what it was built for. But it's not like these things are costing tens of thousands of dollars. Right. They're, and the technology is getting... More and more folks are coming up with clever technology, mm -hmm. user-friendly. All of it, yeah. And the best part about all of this, the silver lining is, is that there's certain organizations like Facebook and Google that really weren't investing in their two-way. Yeah. And that's why Zoom was outgrowing them because they were like, nobody cares about the business suites and let Zoom sell to those people. They're and then this happened and they're like, yeah. oh my God, everybody wants to connect. And now yeah. Google's got a full suite. Facebook's got a full suite. They can do... 300 seats where it used to be only four. So right. you're going to see that the, the, the bigger giants yeah. are now doubling down on this, which means the software you're using is, has a certain stability to it in the sense that they're not going to go away in six months or pivot into something else. And suddenly the tech you bought doesn't do the job you needed it to do. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Hey, you, you mentioned something um, in a conversation about tech stacking. <laughs> what is tech stacking? So exactly what it sounds like it's taking yeah. i'm going to start with this statement because it's really important there's a difference between complicated and complex complicated is trying to put a bunch of things together because you have them that's not a tech stack so if somebody's like oh i did a tech stack because i had the like we retirement earlier since we had zoom i ran it over here no that's like the burton ernie bit where the yeah. cookies are in the cowboy hat yeah complex 
that, or I'll do this in, in musician terms. When you get to a gig and all the chords are tied together and everything, mm -hmm. that's complicated. When yeah. you get there and somebody's running new gear and so they have to tap it over to here and the recording, so they also have to bring in a recording device, that's complex. It's one thing to the other. So a stack is a complex scenario, not complicated, where you just, whether it's over time or within the same moment, use different technologies to accomplish one single goal. So for instance, I just was doing research on, um, uh, for a, a webinar we do pivot your programs, I was doing research on student involvement fairs because somebody wanted to know about Flipgrid for student involvement fairs. And I looked into Flipgrid and it looked decent, but it wasn't what it was built for. Right. So I started doing some research and I finally got to a school that was doing student involvement fair, not using Flipgrid. It was the University of um, New Orleans. Yeah. And what they did was for their student involvement fair, they had multiple stacks of engagement. Now, this might not be a, a direct stack, but it looked like it, it could have been where they said, well, there's different dates you can sign up. You can go to our Twitch program or you can go to a Zoom meeting. We're going to then have this. So they were taking all these different technologies and combining them in a stack for activation. So it was like a real stack would lead one to the other. But in this case, watching the university use multiple technologies to activate uh, the same, to, with the, to achieve the same goal, which is essentially getting students involved in, you know, in different departments. Right. Yeah. They use the website to then create little groups that you can go off and chat in those chat groups would lead you back to a different meeting with the end result being this involvement day where you can go and recap everything. So that was more of a tech journey, tech journey. where you go from one thing to the next to the next. Yeah. A tech stack would be where you're using multiple at the same time. So if we're on Zoom and we're feeding to Facebook Live and on Facebook Live, we're having people put in their answers for a contest that's then gonna get fed back to us through Slack so we can see it on our Slack while we're inside the Zoom call. That's a tech stack. That's cool. Because the chats would not be ideal in Zoom, so we would use Slack and that way we can communicate back and forth with the person sending us the Facebook feeds and so, so on and so forth. Simultaneous use of platforms to achieve the same goal. Yeah, simultaneous or within time. So if you, it, yeah. it, you know, connected, is the sense of how I would look at it. Multiple technologies stacked together to serve one purpose. Right. Then you can get into APIs and integrations and where those things are built out already. Okay, hold, stop. Speak, um, what's an API? So I'm gonna always, I, I can't give you the acronym, but an API is basically an open language port for two technologies to speak to each other. Okay, a translator. So it's a translator, it is literally okay. that. Okay. In some cases, there are APIs already designed to speak to one another. So like Zoom has an API, with SurveyMonkey or somebody and they're already, okay. their coders have already done it. Okay. But then you have like a, a tool called Zapier. I don't know if you ever heard of that. I've heard of it, but I don't know what it does. Zapier is basically your own integration tool, your own API tool. So if those technologies have an open API, which means if you want to try to do the translating yourself, we, we, we'll leave that open to you. You can go to Zapier, find those technologies. It's kind of like an if this, then that. Where you said, if okay, the Zapier somebody messages me here, send it over here do this if somebody opens my zoom and so you can create your own integrations right there on Zapier. So, so Zapier is more like a DIY language, language translator app. It's more like a conditional logic tool that already knows how to talk to the other tools. Okay. In the sense that if this thing says this, it, it's like a right. Goldberg engine. It's like, it's like mousetrap. Hit the ball, go down here, turn this thing okay. on. It's not more it's of the a, direct a, API. A, a, a coder would do that. This is kind of like a, right. I heard the mess. It's like a translator, literal, like telephone translator. Yeah. All it's right, switchboard. So tell me what's, uh, do you have an example of a school that, that just did an amazing event this that in the last few months? I honestly have not been on the event side or the, or the production side and haven't looked at enough of them to really, I've seen what some schools are doing and I'm super impressed. Yep. But I don't have a data set for you to be like, okay. this one was the best. What I mostly look for, though, is not the execution of the event. And that's yeah. also a reason. It's not of interest to me. I mean, events, I always said glitch happens. I mean, we produced, when I was at GenieCast, we produced several thousand of these. And, you know, some days we might have a dozen going on at the same time. So wow. you start to look at things in more of a macro way of how do we learn? How do we improve? How do we make the next user experience better? And it's the same way that I look at schools. Like I look at what I'm more impressed with is how little a lot of schools that I came in contact to with in April 
now are telling me about technologies and tools and asking me to look into things that I didn't even know about. And I actually feel good. Like I kind of predicted, I'm like, the goal here is get you guys to know more than I do. I said this on like one of the first webinars we did when this all started blowing up. Right. So I'm like, I just look at things logically. I'm not out playing with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, hope for, uh, w with your attitude, you've got good hope for the, the future of virtual. I always had hope for the, I, it wasn't even yeah. hope. I, I always yeah. saw virtual as just the future. I mean, and yeah. look, everybody did. I mean, outside of the flying cars, what was the other stuff that happened on Star Trek? And, you know, we're beaming people back and forth, but everybody was looking at everybody's, like we predicted this coming. Uh, but I, I used to say this in the early days when I started, because um, I started in the business 2014. Yeah. That sounds right. So it was very rare that people were even using it for, like Skype was more about free phone calls than it was even video communication right. back then. People right. got Skype accounts because they could get around international. But I remember within the first year and a half, I was watching like a four or five year, one of my nieces at four or five years old, you know, having FaceTime with my grandfather in another state who was like 91. So that's how quickly the adoption rate was happening. And it was happening before the pandemic happened. Yeah. It's just in certain areas, it wasn't invested in. So yeah. most of us were making video calls, even though the companies or the schools or the institutions we worked for hadn't really been investigating or in yeah. investing in it. The wave was already happening. So it's not a matter of hope. I think it's just inevitable. And we, and we, we encourage everyone to, to, to embrace it, right? You, you, you have one choice to evolve or not. I mean, yeah. the only constant is change. You sure. don't have to embrace it, but then yeah. you're just not going to be participating with it. Like, it's the same thing. You don't have to get on social media. Right. But the person next to you might be a little bit more connected and informed. However, they also might be a little bit more anxiety ridden because they're on social media. So each person has a choice. But yeah. the way this is moving, yeah. it's just going to be the way people communicate. I mean, we have gotten to a point in a very short period of time where we communicate. We communicate in hieroglyphics. I mean, I send gifts and emojis more than I send words to certain people. And we're communicating at a level that's probably deeper than trying to understand what did that sentence mean? Mm -hmm. You know what the video uh, image means. Uh, interesting. So we're yeah. evolving in a way that people aren't even picking up on. And we're connecting better. It's just about being genuine, being authentic, and... Uh, understanding that it's just an extension of who you are. And if you treat it that way, you can, I mean, embracing it's not even an option. It's like a toy you're gonna to wanna to play with. Right, oh, that's great. That's a great perspective. It's great advice. Um, is there anything that you, you wanna um, cover before I ask you some final questions? You know, I, I find that I've, I'm always saying the same thing, which is just go out and break stuff. So if there's anybody that's like, this all sounds great, but I'm afraid, I still have not heard to date of a, somebody dying due to a virtual event or, you know, there's no stage collapses, there's no riots, you know, it's, it's not Altamont in the 70s or whatever, like, you know, nobody's, nobody's getting stabbed by a biker gang. It's virtual. Yeah, there's going to be some Zoom bombing and you figure it out and you get around it. But this is a very forgivable marketplace right now. The bar is very low. If you watch the news, people are gaffing all the time and not connecting. And nobody's like, oh my God, CNN's closing tomorrow. So don't look at your event or your engagement or whatever you're going to do and say, this is, if this doesn't work, I'm done. It's the, the furthest thing from the truth. Just manage right. expectations and say, hey, we're trying new things yeah. and try new things. That's um, the biggest thing. Don't be afraid to break stuff. Don't be afraid to break stuff. I love that. Doug Hall, ready for rapid fire questions? Go. Okay, where would you go if you could go anywhere in the world? Oh my God, you're doing this to me. <laughs> um, uh, Tibet. Tibet, okay. If you could send yourself a care package of snacks, what's in the box? What's in the box? It's not going to Paltrow. But uh, it would be something keto so that I didn't actually gift myself with breaking diets, which I would be doing anyway. Okay, 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 and- It would be sensible thinking, whatever I put in there. Sensible snacks is what you'd get. Mm -hmm. Ready for this? Go back to middle school. What was your favorite band in middle school? Oh, the same band that I've carried through life, Van Halen. Van Halen, that's great. Even, you know, it's like, you know, watching your parents split and then screw up the family reunion and stuff, you still love them deep in your core. But I mean, I, I have a love for all different types of music, but Van Halen was always the one that just carried me through life experiences. and. I hate to admit it, especially coming from Long Island, I am a bigger Sammy fan than I am a Dave fan. 
Yeah, no, that's okay. That's okay. Is there a song? Do you remember your first experience with Van Halen? Like, uh, first song for me was Jump only because I was young enough that it just caught my attention and made yep. Van Halen want to be my favorite band. I mean, it came out when I was nine. But I would say that the, most of the songs on 5150 because I was going through, you know, that into, you know, it was that wonder years time in my life. It was like seventh, yeah. eighth grade into, into high school. So, you know, 5150 was definitely like when the hormones kicked in, like when it's love and, you know, summer nights, it was like, there was a lot more rebellion. Right. So I think I have more of a nostalgic connection to that right. album, even though there was four or five before that, that Good. certainly had an impact on it. Wait, say, say again, which was your nostalgic? nostalgic? 5150. 5150, and that had Sammy Hagar. Yep, it was his first one. It's probably why it's so deep, you know, to my heart, right, because right. I was going it, through that, you know, becoming yeah, yeah, a man. Yeah. Not quite a girl, not yet a well, let's Either way, I'm going to go play the vinyl right now, which I found in uh, when I was on a trip to Denver, which is so hard to find. Oh, that's awesome. So um, what's the first line of Jump? Uh, I get up. All right, let's sing it together. Right. I get up. Oh. And it oh, gets me down. Yeah. Got it tough. Getting the toughest soul round. But I know. <laughs> Baby, just <laughs> like how you feel. You've got, you got the wrong one. The project is to get, get to watch for real. You're the musician, so I'm going to. I used to joke. Then and here I got my back against a record machine. All right, you sing the next part. I ain't the worst that you've seen. And then, I can't then, see what I mean. See, it's like I could definitely do an Anthony Michael Hall, but it would be mostly just drinking the whiskey. Oh my Anthony god. Michael Hall. I mean, Anthony. Uh, oh my god! I just said Anthony Michael Hall. Anthony. It's Michael. It's Michael. Michael Anthony. Michael Anthony. It's Michael I was saying Anthony Michael Hall, which right? you Breakfast Club. Right? All right, man. That was awesome. I can't believe you just got me the same. I represented talent for 15 years, I think, and I never even got near a stage and one video call, and you got me squealing freaking Van Halen. Well played, sir. Well played. Oh, rock and roll, man. Right Thanks on. for being here, Doug. Thank uh, you. This was high fun. Five. High five. High five. Brother. Boom. Hit it. <laughs>